Hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Dark Parade. My name is Bo. I am your host for these proceedings. Uh, I will be joined today by one Duncan McLeish. Uh, you may be aware of other uh, programs in which I uh, sit down with Duncan to talk about other things. Um, notably, and almost finally, uh, we have been talking about the Slasher series for what seems like forever, and we are almost to the end of it, and I couldn't be happier, but if you want to catch up to any of that, uh, you can do so at Duncan and Bo Come Correct, which is a whole different podcast, and uh, we started off doing movies, and then we did Twin Peaks, and then we did Westworld, and then we did Slasher, and we've done some Duran Duran albums, and it's really just an excuse for Duncan and I to sit down and chit-chat about whatever. So, uh, I think you will enjoy this conversation because it is very much a, a talk between old friends, uh, about a movie that is really good. And so the movie today is Moby Dick. And although we touch on this a little bit in the, in the course of the conversation, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to do it for this season, which is all about like horrors on and beneath the waves um, is because this is, in many ways, the touchstone for a lot of other horror films and a lot of other science fiction films, as you'll hear in the discussion. Like, Star Trek II could not exist in the form it does without Moby Dick. And so you can argue, well, maybe the book, but not necessarily the movie. But I kind of argue the movie. There's a, a grimness to this movie. There's a bleakness to it. Uh, and And... A an icon iconography in the persona of uh, Captain Ahab that, as portrayed by Gregory Peck, that I think you kind of need for a lot of horror cinema. Like you know, we talk about in the discussion, like this it, Jaws would not exist as it does without this movie in particular. So I I think that we do a fine enough job of justifying the existence of this episode. I hope. But it was when I was assembling the list of movies, it made perfect sense to include Moby Dick, and I, I hope you think so as well. Uh, but uh, without further ado, we'll just jump into it. Here is my discussion with Duncan about 1956's Moby Dick. So uh, enjoy. Ahoy there, me mateys. No, it's no, no, no. <laughs> just, I haven't even introduced you yet. Just calm down. So we have uh, before us, uh, this is, uh, the, you know, obviously the third movie we're talking about this month about horrors of the deep. And um, rather than talk about Jaws, I thought, what if we talked about the movie that couldn't exist or that, that Jaws couldn't exist without? And also weirdly Star Trek 2. Uh, so... Um, it's important then that if we're if we're talking about a movie like Moby Dick, a, a legitimate uh, cinematic classic directed by one of the great Hollywood directors of all time, then you get somebody of the caliber, the the, the podcasting powerhouse that can bring not just asses to the seats, but is gonna keep those asses right there in those seats the entire time, and that was not available. So, <laughs> so instead, I got my old pal from Duck and Bo Cup Correct and uh, of Science Crazed fame on this very show. So back it up, uh, Science Crazed with Moby Dick. It's, of course, Duck and McLeish. Yeah, I, th I think this is the payoff to Science Crazed. We sat through that movie in order to give ourselves permission to do this. Yeah, and... I'll, I'll say right off the bat, like, you know, Dark Parade obviously is a horror podcast. Mm. Is Moby Dick a horror movie? Eh, maybe it's more of a seafaring drama, but it, there is so much in the realm of genre filmmaking. Vengeance, particularly. Like, the, the very concept of vengeance as we see it portrayed on the screen nowadays in the horror genre the idea of you know when embarking on a journey for vengeance packed two shovels that's mm -hmm. Moby Dick so yeah I mean it's it's vengeance it's obsession there's yep. a hint of kaiju oh. in this movie <laughs> 
just a turd. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, Bo, Bo, you don't need to sell this on me. And you don't need to sell it on the listeners because they are ungrateful if they are expecting anything less than if Bo Ransdell says that this can be held on his show, then guess what? It can be held on this show. All right. Yeah, thank you. So when, Duncan, hmm. did you first encounter, not necessarily the book, because i got to be honest, I've never finished the book Moby Dick. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a little, a little wordsome for me. <laughs> there wasn't a lot happening, like, entertainment-wise around, like, the, the mid-1800s. <laughs> like, so they could afford to spend a bit of extra time beefing things out. Um, I would love I... to see, like, somebody in 1865 just show them Avengers Endgame. Yeah, and just be like, <laughs> what in the fuck? <laughs> Oh, let me put it this way. If Pornhub existed back then, this book would have been short. Well, so would Civilization. Like, we never would have made it <laughs> out, out of... If you if you could steam no power... revolution. Yeah. If you could have steam-powered pornography, it would have been all over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, I, I love the, the idea of an alternative history where porn decided whether we went down uh, steam navigation or, like, some other, like... <laughs> Some other like based like industrial revolution train. It would all be semen powered. Like everything yeah, would not, just hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um I saw this for the first time when because I was thinking about this. I've seen that this is the third time that I've seen Moby Dick. Um only the third time. Uh the first time I would have seen it is with my granddad, and I reckon that would have been I would have been about nine or ten, I think. Okay. So the second time I saw it was as a teenager. So like a bit older. I wouldn't quite have been 18, but I imagine in or around like the 16 mark. So it has been many, many years since I've seen this. Um, so much so that like my memory of whole sections of of the casting was very wrong. Like very, like, very, very, very wrong. To the point where, and this is where, like, you read internet facts and those internet facts cross over and become your reality. And then you just take that reality forward. Um, my my distinct memory of this movie, until you mentioned that we're going to be chatting about, uh, you, you were very much excited to be chatting about Mr. Peck's performance mm -hmm. as Ahab was Orson Welles had played Ahab, which he apparently did um, in a lost movie. Uh, which came out before this. Yeah. So, like, my, my distinct memory was... Now, Orson Welles is in this adaptation, so, um, so I wasn't completely off the off the mark, but I had a very distinct memory that it was Orson Welles that played um, Ahab. And then you were like, oh, yeah, Pex Ahab. And I was like, Bo's going to feel real silly when he sits down and watches this movie. <laughs> um, and then I was like, no, 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 like, Bo is right. Uh, which, once again, we've said many times is a sentence I don't like to utter, so yeah. I'm not going to say it again. Uh, I don't like to yeah. hear it. It, it, <laughs> it. it makes me feel like something's horribly wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'd, I'd, it'd been a long time since watching it, and we were talking off here uh, about, my, once again, my recollection of this was that this was a spry hour and a half as well, um, and it's just under the two hour mark. Mm. So I was all over the place. Basically, what I'm saying to you is. I was all over the place. Even the director. Like, I, I could not remember this being John Huston. Um, I don't know who I thought had directed this, but, um, yeah. So I, I found it that I actually knew very little about this movie. Uh, the only thing I did know was Ray Bradbury had done the, the adaptation. Uh, yeah, strangely. which is really fascinating. Very weird. Like, that, that guy is that guy's probably at the forefront known for his science fiction work. Yeah, science uh, fiction, fantasy stuff, but yeah. Um, but again, I I don't think Moby Dick is that far afield no. from the the kind of stuff that Ray Bradbury was writing anyway. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think it, it makes. I mean, to be honest, it like uh, if you were at this time period, what's interesting about it is that John Huston himself was a very accomplished screenwriter. Mm hmm. Which apparently is one of the was one of the big contentions on on the production was that Houston and Bradbury apparently didn't really like each other all that much. Um, 
which is always great when you get those stories, you know, where like you just like each other, um, because they have two ideas of how things should look. Um, and it, it's always what is there anything more like obnoxious than like a really talented director who can write as well <laughs> and act? He's a great yes. actor. Oh yeah, he's a, he's a fucking phenomenal yeah. actor. Yeah. So like, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I so, mean, all like, of those uh, things are equally, equally upsetting to yeah. people like myself with limited talent. <laughs> You're supposed to have one thing, Bo. One thing and that's it. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, like my, like I say, my, my memory of this is, is probably being filled in because of the period of time in between viewings with nonsense and gaga. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting viewing yesterday. Uh, of this movie um, sitting down, cleared some time out sat down, uh, had a glass of whiskey, which I think is almost mandatory when you watch Moby Dick um, Orson Welles definitely and, had a couple yeah, and then spent uh, the best part of today um, asking if people can come aboard uh, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> Man, one of the things I really like about this movie though speaking of asking people to come aboard is the veracity of just here's a ship taking off and, and preparing to set sail okay. and and the way that like the people on the dock you know watching the families looking at their husbands and fathers and family members you know setting sail for an indeterminate amount of time and given the time period good odds that they're just not going to come back Oh yeah, like whole families, like whole male lineage of families were wiped out on whaling ships. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like like you could you could literally be ending your family line um, by setting sail. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, uh, what what I also like about this is we have our uh, our loose link back to something that we have done on Duncan and Bo. Uh, it wouldn't be wouldn't be a show at all or a conversation without a link back to Twin Peaks and Royal Dano mm -hmm. uh, plays Elijah in this who was also in Twin Peaks. So that's our link there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, if Royal Dano tells you something, you believe that shit's gonna come true. Oh, absolutely. It <laughs> uh it, it's I there there's a lot I like about it. so just to match your story when i when i first saw moby dick it was one of those things where just you know some school teacher or another was like i'm a little hungover i don't want to teach you animals <laughs> so for the next week we're going to be watching moby dick yeah we could do the book but that's an entire year yeah uh, well, let's not do that let's just watch the movie I know you're not going to read it. You know you're not going to read it. Let's not bullshit each other. And here's the movie. And it's close enough. We'll read Billy Bud and that will be close enough. Um, so, yeah. So I saw it the first time in high school. And the thing that stuck with me. By the way, spoilers for Moby Dick throughout this conversation. Uh, a movie that is over 60 years old in a book that is 150. I know. Um, so, you know, you had time to catch up to it is what I'm saying. Um, it's the, the scene at the end with Ahab being fixed to the, the whale oh, yeah. with his yeah. arm, you know, beckoning. Weaving. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, he's dead. There there be the captain dead, but he beckons us still. Um, and I remember seeing that as a kid and being like, that is fucked up. Oh, it's dark. Yeah. Like, it's especially dark. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a dark movie in general. Yeah. And uh, that hung with me. And then I saw it a couple of times just throughout my life because I just like it. I mean, it's a movie mm -hmm. that is filled with great performances and really, you know, interesting themes. And it's... It's genre. a bona fide classic, isn't it? Like, I, like, there's certain movies that just... Like, we talked about one... Um, when we were doing the Fincher run on Opera Omnia about like Citizen Kane there are certain movies that are just like known quantities as classics yeah yeah. are they perfect movies? no like there, there, there's some issues there's some things that are a little bit rough around the edges however like in terms of tomes of cinema and their importance Moby Dick is one of those yeah and interestingly when it came out in 1956 like Gregory Peck took a lot of shit for his performance. 
Yeah, I think it's it's kind of it's universally um, kind of seen as being ill cast, and I, I like I really I really wanted to double down. Like once again, I my I I remember reading that the Ahab performance was ill cast, which has always been something that's confused me because once again I thought it was Orson Welles. Um, I don't know, like whiskey has ruined my brain. Um, and <laughs> yeah. uh, like sitting down, like to watch it, like once I had contextualized that, I was like, I'm gonna really like kind of pay attention to that. I think his performance is like it's surprisingly good. Yeah, like, I think I it's think, iconic. Like, yeah, it, it, I, I think the issue, if you could have any issues, he is genuinely surrounded by other powerhouse performers which might lessen that role but there's a darkness in that character that I think Peck embodies incredible I like when he is you know very quiet and he's his determination when he's speaking to people on these voice races I am with him mm-hmm. beat by beat through everything he says I think there's an easy way I actually think Orson Welles would over like you hear his performance as the father and I think he's over the top. He's so ostentatious and all the rest. And it, it does make me wonder if that if that role had been cast in the way of the, the kind of lost footage or whatever, what that would actually look like. And I think there's something... Like, you see all the other... The beautiful thing about it is you see at least two other sea captains in this movie that have, you know, had encounters with Moby Dick. And you see what that has done to them and those two performances are wildly different Mm -hmm. than Peck because they are like one is kind of like you know I'm lucky that I now have this new rum opener (laughs) as a hand another guy's like you know he's taken my son he's taken my heir and all the rest like the destroyed character who is not thinking about the whale is thinking about finding his son Mm -hmm. other character who is looking at this is like look at this shiny new spike I have instead of a hand uh, you know, we should go back and get another one. Um, and then yeah. you see, like, the actual, the, the rot of obsession and how that's essentially gnawed away at this guy. And I think Peck's performance is, it'd be so easy to play that over the top. And I think I think that there's a, a kind of almost an, an understated way that he plays it that I think works to the movie's advantage. Because, like, Moby Dick in this movie is, like, as an entity... I mean, it doesn't have the... As someone that has read the book before and got to the end mm-hmm. of it, uh, look at me all fancy with all my time not sleeping. Um, like, the like the actual concepts and themes of what the, the whale portrays himself is kind of stripped out in the movie, and I think for good purpose, um, especially for the time period, like, the, the focus here is, is specifically on... Ahab's obsession and less to do with the symbolism of what the wheel actually portrays. Um, and as a result of that, I think that allows Peck's performance to be a little bit more muted. Um, and like I say, at times when he's rising up, like the, the scene of him, like, you know, uh, removing the, the green aura from the, you know, the spike eye, the, 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 this yeah, last Yeah, the St. Elmo's fire, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, like, the, this last challenge that he has to overcome before he can finally face off against the whale and all the rest. I look at that and I'm like, I am with him. Yeah. I'm like, yes, let's, onwards! <laughs> like, sails up, I'm like, like, the, and the, like I say, I think it's easy to sit there and just, well, he's surrounded by other great character actors who are performing really, really well, and maybe he's the the black sheep performer there. But I think it requires the black sheep performer. Yeah, uh, the scene where you know he's talking to his first maid, who's like, you know, you need to get some sleep, yeah, you, you need to go to bed, and he's like, that's no bed, that's a coffin, you know. Yeah. And you're just like, I don't know who else could deliver it like that. Yeah, where it's it's him ve- speaking very poetically. And and Gregory Peck himself kind of complained about Bradbury slash John Huston borrowing so much dialogue from the book that he was like, yeah. this is just hard stuff to say and make it sound natural and like, you know, something a human being would say. Yeah. You know, don't don't tell that to Khan Noonien Singh, you know what I'm saying? 
But, well, yeah, that, that's sort of like I mean, it can it can be delivered well. Um, it's great. I think like when he when he is stabbing the whale at the end and he's doing the you know uh-huh. <laughs> you mentioned can but you know when he's talking about you know from hell's heart I stab it the I think I think it's done really really yeah. really well. I think he, he adds a degree of gravitas without adding a degree of overacting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and so. and, and and coupled with kind of the savagery that he's just yeah. stabbing this whale oh, over yeah, and yeah. over again you know for yeah. hate's sake i spit at the you know yeah it's it's, it's, it's powerful shit it's um, great um yeah. and what i love about it is the whale don't give a fuck moby dick don't <laughs> give a fuck he's too big um he's he's the honey badger of the sea um so. <laughs> that's that's what they often say about sperm whales is that they're the honey badgers of the sea <laughs> <laughs> also like I also like the fact that like he, he like once it once he's like right like Ahab's out the way, now I'm gonna take care of these sailors and these little robots. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm just gonna take down that shit. It's it's the Fuck old the like Rodney Dangerfield joke from <laughs> uh back to school where mm-hmm. he's like, you know, the quarterback of my whole high school was tough when he sacked the quarterback after after that he'd go after his family. And yeah. that's kind of Moby Dick <laughs> is like you how dare you yeah. Try to, to, to try to take me down, and I'm going to kill every last motherfucker yeah. that comes at me. You know, it's like yeah. you you come at the king, you best not miss. Yeah, and oh, yes. and they miss. Yeah, and, they, 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 they miss horribly. Yeah, <laughs> but all right. So let let's traipse through the plot. We went, again, we're not yeah. going to go scene by scene, but just overall. Um, so it starts off with the 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 you know classic call me Ishmael. I, uh, yeah, Richard yeah. Basehard, yeah, uh, as as Ishmael, and it's him rolling into this seaside town, and it's actually a great opening narration, I think, yeah. about like you know the, the water draws us all to the sea, and that's where a man can see the reflection of himself, and mm-hmm. you know it's a wonderful dialogue, it's it's well delivered. Richard Basehard, I think, is really good in this. And um, he ends up also starts very jaunty, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like a very like it's whimsical, it's full of promise and prospect, and the score is uplifting and magical. And you just need to retain all this to remember where the movie ends. <laughs> um, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, like, it's like there's a, there's a kind of almost uh, and they've done it like in, like almost every movie, like kind of post this. I'm sure there was a few before, but that idea of when you're embarking on the most dangerous journey, it kind of has to start off uplifting. You want the audience mm-hmm. in, you want like, this is an adventure, it's adventure, you know, this is an adventure we're going on. And, um, like, even even the kind of setup when he walks into the, so he arrives, you know, goes into the bar, the barman's like, you know, are you going well? And, um, and he's like, yeah, I'm going well. And he's like, oh, well, you best be asking for permission. And he's like, I don't know why I've made him a pilot. But he's a pilot. Yeah, but um, yeah, Stubbs, the who's uh, like the second mate, I think is his he's position. The second mate, yeah, he's and, under I think he's Star Starbuck. Starbuck. Yep, Starbuck. And yeah, and he's uh, he's really gregarious, and and they're singing songs. But like you said, he's you know, I you best be believing in whaling stories. <laughs> you're in one. You're in one. <laughs> 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 he says, <laughs> he says uh, like you said, you know, you know, you you need my permission to kill whales on the sea and stuff yeah. like that. And it's just them goofing off, singing songs, getting loaded. Yeah. And hey, last night it's their last night before they go out for like you see an indeterminate amount of time on the sea. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you you're gonna have a belly full. You're gonna sing some songs, especially when you're on that ship. Uh, and and you have Captain Ahab as your captain, a man that's not known for a jolly sea shanty, bo. Like the song, it, it's like a record scratch because yeah. he happens to walk by, and yeah. you you don't see him at first. You just hear the like. You don't see him for like a huge, yeah, like a, for huge, a long time like chunk of this movie, like like a big portion of the beginning. You're like what twenty plus minutes in before you finally see him, and even when you see him. It's the reaction of someone seeing him first and being like, oh, like, right, like, oh, fuck, Ahab, Ahab, Ahab. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, you hear him doing that, like, thunk, thunk, you know, as he's walking with his peg leg outside. And uh, then he's like, hey, are you Hawkins? And then, then, yeah. that's a, sorry, different movie. Uh, but 
they it, but everybody gets quiet and they're like oh that's that's ahab and anyway ishmael um ends up bunking with queequeg for yeah a for guy the night. who he doesn't he doesn't know any details about and he's mistaken the 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 dialect of the the conversation that he has with the barkeep he's basically like he's off selling heads and he's like all right does that mean he's like selling heads lad uh you know he's like mm, all of that and like when he when he's he's up in his room getting ready to bunk and all the rest and he hears his, his bunk mate come in looks up there is an actual shrunken head um, yeah which terrifies the ever living fuck out of him uh, and the the bar man in the in this scene is they overdub John Huston's voice. That's right, yes. So it's this old man with big mud and chops going, I told you, he's got a head! <laughs> you know, and it's, oh, it's so good. Uh, I love it so much. And yeah, sure enough, <laughs> uh, Ishmael is like, I'm not supposed to be sleeping in the same bed with a cannibal. It's like, he'll be fine, just get some sleep. <laughs> I and, directed the Maltese Falcon. <laughs> Um, Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Uh, <laughs> I was Gandalf. Um, so <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the other thing. We, that's the other thing we missed. Acclaimed voice actor as well. Not just actor, yeah, but acclaimed voice actor. Motherfucker. Frodo of the Nine Fingers. Um, <laughs> if you have seen the Ralph Bakshi. Lord of the Rings. Of course I have. You will recognize that tune. Along with uh, Where There's a Whip, There's a Way. Which is maybe the finest song ever written. Yeah. Um, it's also what I have tattooed above my cock. Um, <laughs> and an arch. You know, like most people get thug life. Mm. But where there's a whip. Do you have it in that kind of gothic script as well? Of course. Oh, yes. That, yeah, yeah. It has to be ye olde, ye olde English. Uh, where thine is a whip. There's a, nah, I don't know, even know what that is in the old English. Let's move on. Anyway, um. so Queequeg <laughs> and Ishmael um, end up, you know, kind of coming to terms with one another. And they're like, hey, we're about to go sign up for whaling ships. Let's sign up for the same one and we'll kind of keep an eye out for each other. Yeah, besties. Yeah. <laughs> um, squad goals. So they sign on for the Pequod, yeah. Which th is this is this is after after they attend like like if you imagine midnight mass with Orson Welles. Oh, Man, oh, oh sure, uh, oh, dude, dude. This church is so damn good. Um, yeah. This whole sequence is great because it is a church in a whaling town, yes. and so the pew is part of a ship that he has to climb a rope ladder up into the pulpit and pulls it up after him to make sure... That... I would be... I, I'll tell you right now, if that's what churches were like, Bo, I would be at church. Oh, 100%. I'd be, like, even if I didn't believe, I'd be like, we're, go we're going though, aren't we? He's got a boat pew. <laughs> Not only does he have a boat pew, the, uh, the, the lesson being taught for that day mm -hmm. is Jonah and the whale... Yes, I mean, it's, it's, if it was any more on the nose, Bo would have to punch herself. Um, like, you know what I mean? And he he's giving this whole sermon about how Jonah was trying to hide from God, you know, and the whale was God basically saying, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it wraps up with him saying, um, delight is to him who coming today, him, dr uh, is, come, who, ah, delight is to him. Who coming today him down can say, Oh, Father, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine more than to be this world's. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee. For what is man that he should live out the lifetime of his God? It's like, uh, all right. <laughs> all right. And, Bye. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> Best of luck, everyone. Um, but they, you're all gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> you best be believe. Yeah, it's that. It's, it's <laughs> all the way through this movie. Yes, yeah. all the way through this movie. They, but the thing is, though, they cut. They do these cutaway shots where, like, Richard Basehart as Ishmael is kind of like nodding and smiling. Yeah. It's like you would be horrified. Like your hair would be turning white. 
I like Joe Beth myself. Williams. Like, <laughs> like, uh, like visibly shot myself in church. It should, like, as he's that... preaching, you just hear throughout the the, the uh, congregation. <laughs> as <laughs> as sailor after sailor shits themselves. This is that's absolutely terrifying. It's like absolutely, it's absolutely terrifying. But in a lot of respects, so this this kind of that kind of cleverly because they're stripping out a lot of the like I said before the symbolism of what uh, Nobody Dick is portrayed in the book as. They're just front loading this. They're just giving you like a this is an exposition dump. But like handled by Orson Welles, this is like the it's like the, the fucking balls on these guys, bro. Yeah, um, it's like it's it's set never. It, this this is this is giving you all you need to know. And then if like if you if you were like that, mm, not understanding this yield tiny language and all this, you know, fire and brimstone talk. Like the movie then gives you like Elijah on the dock basically saying, listen, <laughs> like. Yeah. You're, you're gonna go out there, and this is what's gonna happen. And then you board the boat, and you, the, as the audience, if you're not aware of what's gonna happen, then you're in for a bumpy ride, Bo. Yeah, well, it is, you know, Moby Dick is God's punishment uh, yes. on uh, uh, upon this man in particular, and anyone oh, yeah. fool he, enough to throw yeah, well, in. Because Ahab, unlike all the other people, Ahab's not at service, because Ahab doesn't really believe in God. Yeah, he has the trappings of that, but I mean, he's he, his obsession is Moby Dick. There is no yes. other. There's nothing else, you know. He has yeah. that great line about, you know, I would I would punch the the sun if it offended me, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. Like he is he he is a base person for as eloquent as he is. He is just yes. he is as much an animal as Moby he, Dick. He literally, he offers the crew essentially any money that he would get anything that would keep him potentially sustainably alive post the capture of Moby Dick he offers his share his full share mm-hmm. to the crew if they help him on it well so all right so before we get to Ahab because we're barreling ahead so th- yeah. yeah they they sign on for uh the Pequod yes and which they're given like okay you're gonna it, basically the way it works is we're gonna go out whaling you're going as a crew member you get a, a, a fraction, a portion of the proceeds of all the yep. whale oil that you bring back, and um, and it's what one three hundredth. Oh yeah, it's, it's it's not a lot. Yeah, and so uh, then we've got the the royal Dano who gives the prophecy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, when Royal Dano speaks, you listen. Yeah, and he says, "The day you smell land where there is no land, that day Ahab will meet his death, and after he will return and beckon others, save one to follow him." And uh, so, this is uh, Elijah, yes, uh, who you know was a prophet in the Bible. So the prophet Elijah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> so again. <laughs> It's kind of on the nose, yeah. uh, but like, I like it. I like it. Uh-huh. Sure. And so... I believe this is what they call foreshadowing. <laughs> well, or just like, here's the end of the, your movie. Um, yeah, and it doesn't... Well, the thing about it is, like, like, this isn't one of these ones where it's like... Uh, it's kind of like when you watch the Blair Witch Project and they're like that. You know, oh, yeah, it's like the old creepy witch bitch used to take people up into a house and one would stand against the wall while the other one would be killed and then the movie ends exactly that way and then yeah. people walked to the cinema going I don't get the end and I'm like what he literally told you at the start what was going to happen he said the thing the thing with the thing in the house and the thing with the corner thing oh yeah, yeah I didn't get that get out <laughs> um, which is kind of here like like it's, it's, a, it's a great line and you know like, like we say it's a foreshadow to the, mm-hmm. the whole voyage and then once again, the movie is like that. Let's enjoy the whimsy of a sea voyage, which we kind of, kind of, yeah, lean into all the while with a black cabin, uh, with a closed door, which hides Ahab, who is not speaking to his crew and not coming out. It's yeah. It as as they're making way. Like I said, one of my favorite parts of this whole movie is the preparation for the ship and seeing them yeah. like okay, we're, we're kind of pulling ourselves out and they're singing this song to have the rhythm, uh, you know, um, 
and moving out of the the harbor and letting the sails down and seeing all the people like there is that one woman who just has you know a beard better than mine <laughs> that is this old crone of a lady who's just watching stone-faced yeah as presumably like a grandson a son somebody is heading out either um, that or just someone who has lost everything already and she's just there because that's what you do in the town yeah you know yeah. what i mean it's that it's that fucked up way that you know you could imagine she's lost everyone already but you chew out when the boat leaves yeah um it's but it, it, i just added even more dramatic backstory boy i love it, it there is a, a hint of it, like a modern day equivalent might be like a robert eggers or something of just like mm. we are going to get this right this is how yeah. it was and and john Huston, to his credit um like talk to whalers and and historical societies and all that kind of stuff of like i want to get this right this is i want to i want to show people setting to see at yeah. this time and what that was like and I, I find that really interesting um and then ishmael kind of gives the rundown of the crew we mentioned Stubbs. there yeah. is uh starbuck who is the first mate and i love his line about starbuck he says uh his courage was one of the great staples of the ship, like beef or flour. There when required, and not to be foolishly wasted. Mm -hmm. Which is a terrific line. And uh, Stubbs we mentioned, um, you know, his pal Queequeg. And then there's uh, Pip, the, yeah. the, the young black kid that they just have on board to shake the tambourine. <laughs> Occasionally point something at who, the camera. Who dies gnarly. Yeah. He goes bad, man. Like, I, I felt so bad for that kid. It was like, you did not deserve this. But, like, and they run through a number of the other um, members of the crew. Like, they're all whalers. And, you know, you, you see them uh, throwing the harpoons to kind of show off their, their skills with that kind of thing. But it's, you know, here, here we are launching out. We've got our crew of, of characters. Um, and finally, as you said, there, there is the appearance of Ahab as they're all just like, and it's, it's one of the, the other members of the crew talking to Ishmael and just being like, yep, we just start back there and scrub the deck. Yeah. And then we get up here and finish. And then when we're done, we start back there again. And it just gives us something to do until we're into whaling waters so yeah. that we don't just go crazy and and lose our shit. But then everybody looks up because uh, Ahab has appeared. Yeah. Ahab Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Um, it's up on the... Oh, my God. And... Come on! There's no way they didn't model. I'm sure he doesn't look like that in the book. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, it, it is a very... Le like, he's got the top hat and the beard oh. and... Um, More scores. But he's got, like, a, a, a pretty wicked-looking scar that turns... Hey, the like, you know, let's talk about this, right? So he's... Like, not only is he missing the leg and has uh -huh. essentially, like, whale ivory bone... It's a like whale's peg. jawbone that yeah, is his, his, his peg leg. leg. Right. Which, I mean, is just absolutely... <laughs> <not. laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the only thing that would have made him more metal is if it was like fucking Neptune's trident, right? Um, you know, what I mean? like, uh, but the like he's got, um, and the other thing is that he has, he has a, like a patch of grey in his beard, mm -hmm. which is the bottom of the scar that runs right up over his eye, like three hundred, mm -hmm. um, like so, right, right up to the top of his hair, which also has this kind of cloth of grey, mm -hmm. um, which. You know, once again, I said the, the man has a lifetime war upon him. Yeah, yeah, it ain't the years; it's the mileage. And yeah, <laughs> and Captain Ahab has racked up some miles. Um, so Ahab then, he, he, you know, basically is like, get all the crew together, and they assemble, and he takes this like gold Spanish coin, an ounce of gold. Yep worth $14 they say which mm -hmm. in 1860s money is you know you can buy a house with that you're fucking balling you yeah know what I mean? and so he nails it to the mast and says hey wh whoever spots Moby Dick first 
gets yeah. this ounce of gold. Yeah. So, you know, what we're looking for is a white whale. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you get the, like, the old uh, Starbuck line, always like that. Uh, but he had, wasn't the white whale the one you lost your leg to? And he's like, I. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't so want to talk about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, but it is like he asks the question, and there's just this giant pregnant pause, and we just zoom in right at his face. He's like, ah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so badass, man. Like, I love oh, it's one of the reasons I love this movie as much as I do, is it's just yeah. filled with these moments of just like, I hate that whale, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, there's a there's a for, for all the metalheads out there, um. The very famous band Mastodon, who I fucking adore, uh, have an album. It's a, probably their best album called Leviathan, and Leviathan basically is Moby Dick. Um, it's like the the whole the, the whole it's this uh, it's a, a concept, concept album. album. Yeah. yeah, it's a full concept album. And the only track that isn't Moby Dick related is the very final one, um, which is a linking thing that did at the end of all their albums, which is songs about uh, Joseph Merrick, the Elephant mm. Man. For no reason at all, but the whole thing. Um, but yeah, like it's just it's it is a total like you like where every time he was doing those quiet moments, I could just like I can just hear fucking like you know. But it 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 is yeah. kind of metal. Like that's the, it's a hundred percent metal. It's metal before metal was metal. Yeah, and that's the thing about I would argue the difference between book and movie. Yeah, is that the book is a very like somber, wordy kind of yeah. you know nothing but allegory and metaphor and all that stuff, and the movie is like let's hunt a whale. And well, yeah, it, like the 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 book the book the, the book is full of themes. Yeah, and like loftier questions about religion, existence, you know, like all, all these things like that. And the movie's like yeah, yeah, that was the first fifteen minutes in the movie. Now let's hunt a whale. Yeah. Now let's yeah. have Gregory Peck saying badass stuff yeah. in the in the hunt for this whale. It's like if you just made a movie about Quint from Jaws, yes. and that's what this is. And in fact, you know, when we were talking earlier about how this movie starts with that kind of light tone, it's mm -hmm. like listen to the John Williams score when 100%. the orca first goes out. And it, and it is that sense of adventure and hey aren't we having a good time and by the yeah. end of it it's like Spielberg like Spielberg openly admits that he was you know yeah it's like heavily influenced by Moby Dick the Quint character is heavily influenced you know it's, it's, it's all it's all there yeah it's all there it's so like there's no there's no happy accident that <laughs> right. you know like, the, like it's, it's all it's all there but once again if you if you're then gonna that's that's how you know it's a, a classic movie when a classic movie references a classic movie. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly. What I mean? That's, yeah, that's yeah. who you know. You know, <laughs> like, and it's and by the way, just to mention it right now while I'm thinking about it, the way this movie is shot hmm. is so damn good, and it feels yeah. very modern. Like, there's a lot of weird angles, and like yeah. we're we're shooting through, you know, these mast ropes and stuff like that to frame this the shot. This took a year to film. Uh, yeah, this movie. So it's, this is this was a task to do. This ain't no like we're gonna go out there and three months shoot and all the rest, and we're gonna have to put up with some challenges. This is a <laughs> year. This was a this was a year to write, a year to shoot, and then a year to edit. Yeah, it's oh man, I, I, it looks three years, Bo. Three years of working on this project, and then it didn't make its money. <laughs> yeah, and then it came out, and people were like, eh, yeah. But, yeah go, Gregory Peck is a little a little stilted in this. And this is why, just now, not that I want to horribly date this show, this is why when I read articles from Variety moaning about how, you know, Hollywood shouldn't be taking gambles on movies like The Northman, I see, fuck you, Variety. See, 20 years from now, people will be looking back at that movie as a goddamn masterpiece. Right, what, what are people going to be talking about 20 years from now? Are they going to be talking about The Northman? Yeah. Or are they going to be talking about Doctor Strange 2? You know? Yeah, exactly. Like, like Doctor Strange a, 2 yeah. will make all of the money. Oh, well, 100%. But... I have no doubt it's going, to be, it's going to be a fun watch. It's going to be bonkers. And I'm really looking forward to it. But yes, 100% people will be looking back and saying, you know, 
this you know this art house director got 90 million to make a movie and this is fucking incredibly beautifully shot movie that's yeah that's what they're going to come back dude it Some has a painless a sword in it that you can only unsheath Have at seen night it, oh seen yeah, it. yeah 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 yeah, that yeah, you yeah. can only unsheath at night or at the gates of hell, and that yeah. is the most awesome thing that has I ever been you, in a movie. Like, I, t- I told like there's a, there, like, there's whole <laughs> sections in this music where like see, like no, that I want to get us all derailed and all the rest. Uh-huh. But see, like there are there are, there are like when they're in the the, kind of the bells of hell towards the end of the movie, and they get ready to fight, and it, like everything's quiet, and it's like yeah you're like holy fucking shit <laughs> like yeah let's get naked as fuck and fight yeah. oh yeah. that's good it's, oh. It's just, oh man we'll I'm talk like, about yeah, this like, on dug it a bow that's, but... a, that's a, a dvcc conversation I think. yeah but but you're right though i mean to your point like time will tell and the northman yeah. is one of those movies that is going to be like like excalibur or something like yeah. that where yeah, it's yeah. like it didn't make that much of a splash at the time, but now people are like, what is one of the most metal movies, uh, you know, uh, that has ever been made? In the Northman is up there. went out, like, a long, longer term, it's very rarely the... That's why, like, it's easy to dismiss... Although we're going to do a reverse for this one, but it's easy It's easy to dismiss um, things like a Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, mm-hmm. because it's all fucking generally nonsense. Right, but ultimately... The movies that critics are shit hot about are the ones that endure in terms of legacy. Audience like interest can like like it's very rare that a movie that has a huge audience love and a not a great critical love are twenty years appraised as being yeah. you know, a classic movie. It, it's, it's very right. it's very, very it does happen occasionally, but it's very very rare it's like um, uh the shining or something like that where yeah. like the shining was got a drubbing from critics and so forth and now 20 years or well 40 years later yeah people look back at the shining and are like oh well that's one of the scariest movies ever made and it's yeah. a brilliant film and blah blah yeah. blah like yeah, so and you just, yeah you just you sometimes just that like time will out on these things yeah. and like whatever the whatever the perceived perception of Peck's performance or how it you know didn't draw the money or whatever. Like look at the, the time frame it came out. Look at what was coming out. You weren't getting movies like this, and also it's based on like you mentioned, Bo, a long ass book that a lot of people will have read at school and been like, ugh. Um. So like once you strip all that stuff out, you, you need to get into the the, the the and then with a lot of that symbolism being stripped out of the movie it really is like we say it's like basic it's a basic bitch idea of vengeance and mm-hmm. that in itself is the compelling part to me because like, it's truest form we've all been like we've all been there we've all had a blood vendetta against someone <laughs> where you're like that I will I will hunt you to the edge of the earth yeah. I will track you down and when I get my hands on you we will both go to the grave if I can't just get you to go, and so we've all it's something we can all we can all, you know, see, feel, taste, touch. It's, it's all there. But like, and this is this is why I love the character because like every like every sentence that Peck delivers, there's a, there's even if it's not the most profound shit he's talking about, there's weight behind it and there's yeah. motive. And you know his motives are clear and he's up front. As soon as he nails that gold like, like that. This is what we're doing. You can all be bought. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know you can all be bought, and you will swear fealty to me right now. And they all swear fealty to him on this one. So as a result, when Star but later on is like, you know, maybe we should be done. He's like, you heard them all swear to me that they're they're going to follow me. That you know, they're, they they're my crew and they've swore allegiance to me. Well, that's all I need. Yeah, and one of the crew members even says they would rather be kicked by Ahab than praised by another captain. Like, yes. everybody, because they respect Ahab, they think he's metal as fuck, and he is. Well, look at him! Yeah, <laughs> right. Did you did you not see the whole job on leg? Well, and, you, and he says stuff like, you know, we were talking about uh, this obsession, you know, and, and, and him telling people just outright, like, 
this is what I'm about. I'm going to go kill this fucking whale. And he'll say, like, I'll follow him around the horn and around the Norway maelstrom and around perdition's flames before I give him up. And you're like, all right, I'm in. Like, you seem to know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I totally, that's my, like, it's like, I just constantly feel like you should just have, like, like Slash should be behind them, just, like, everywhere he goes. <laughs> he needs that, like, the the doof guy from uh, Fury Road with the guitar oh, and the flamethrower. I, I, I thought you were going to say, like, the, like, you ever seen the movie I'm Going to Get You Sucker? Oh, sure. Yeah, well, like, you know how, like, wherever he goes, he's got a funk band yeah. playing his theme song behind him? That's what he needs. He needs, like, just, like, a metal guitarist all the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just doing nothing but power chords when he's in one oh, of his monologues. All the time. Chung, yeah. chung, 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 chung. Um, <laughs> he has about to get dark, y'all. Distortion pedal on. Yeah. <laughs> Do it doing the drop um yeah, so like, during the, like the, the heavy storm sequences he's pulling the old jimmy page with a violin yeah Vulgar. oh my god all right oh, so give me that cup. so ahab then calls elijah into his cabin because he's like we're going after this fucking whale elijah and mm -hmm. i know where we're gonna find him because i've got this map that is assembled from all these other whalers who are like they they chart where the whales are and at what time of year and he's like look this fucking moby dick is gonna be at the bikini at all um you know at, at the beginning of summer or whatever beginning of march yeah. and so we're going to be there waiting for him and when he shows his white head we are gonna gank that that whale <laughs> and um and then you get <laughs> uh, then you get a a, a a really fun sequence where you see what they actually do they spot some other whales and you see the process of like here's us hunting down whales like harpooning them and and just you know kind of cool stuff like oh here's then like once they harpoon it they they have this slot in the in the uh, uh bow of the boat that mm -hmm. allows you to kind of hook the uh, the rope into that so it's the whale is essentially pulling you along behind it and you know they end up you know like <laughs> one boat just loses everybody uh, and yeah. they're just like fuck it you know we gotta keep going because we're tied <laughs> to this whale right now and they're probably gonna be fine and uh, but yeah and, and finally they, they kill this whale they you know you see them cut it up and they boil it down into boil the blubber down into the whale oil and everything and you know somebody has a line i don't know if it's it's here or later but like you know basically we light the world yeah. you know that this is you know, it, like yes we're all much more sophisticated now when we understand that these are not animals that you want to hunt and kill like this but without whales like a lot of shit wouldn't have gotten done mm -hmm. in the industrial revolution so for better or worse, you know, the, the whales were, were key to the economy in a lot of ways. And these were the guys out there just in the ocean. Just, I mean, that, if you think about what whaling is for two seconds, yeah, <laughs> it's like, we're going to take this little ass boat, harpoon this big ass whale and hope it doesn't kill us. Yeah. You know, by dragging us under the water, by turning, by yeah. flipping the boats, whatever it yeah. is. Yeah, and we're also going to do it in boats that, you know weren't technologically advanced on waters which were completely unforgiven yeah yeah right. like so like even like even if the whale doesn't kill us all it takes is one good storm uh you know like mother nature might fuck us up uh yeah it's, it's like to think about it it's just like it's baffling yeah it's it but it, it's an impressive bit of filmmaking too to kind of capture this because it is you you kind of get into it it's really exciting you know, like, and you kind of see it all through Ishmael, who at the end of it is like, is it always like this? Like, that was, yeah. that, that was something. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that was a good time, right? Uh, and, and so you kind of get the appeal of it, too. That is this really, you know, uh, I hesitate to say manly, but it is just like it's man versus nature in its purest form. It's like, it's like how um, performers 
describe that the addiction of performing in front of an audience. So once yeah. you've had, once you've performed in front of an audience um, and you've received that adulation, uh, adoration from them, um, an adulation, like nothing else quite lives up to that. You get a taste for it, and then it's the only time you feel alive. And that's what the sailors are doing, which also explains their actions right at the very end. Um, <laughs> so it's yeah. like it's, it's well rooted, and it's I, I, it's those sort of things that I just. Like, it's that attention to detail that I appreciate. Um, it gets it right. Um, yeah, it, it, th that part of it's super, super fun. Anyway, so we we see all of that. So we get a sense of like, okay, here's what they're out there doing when they're not hunting this whale in particular. But sure enough, um, they run into the ship captain. It's the, the, the first one, the one with the yeah. hook hand or the yeah. kind of harpoon hand. Um, who's like, you know, hey, we saw Moby Dick, and he's just the jolliest captain ever. You know, he's just like, ah ha, let's look at my look at my spike hand, ah ha, and he's like, yeah, big old nasty whale took it, you know, all scarred in the face, and you can see like instantly he has like, like like piecing all the stuff together, and he, he asks what color it was, and it's white, and then. But they've just caught some whales at this point, right? As yeah. well, so like they're they're getting ready for their hashtag doing a haul, um, getting ready like hauling some whales and do all this stuff. And as soon as he had, it was like, yeah, we encountered that a month ago down beside you know the the, the, the horn, and he's like, fucking stop the boat, <laughs> like yeah. And <laughs> even Stubbs, who's out there in the whaling waters, yeah. is like. Are you sure, Captain? Because we're out here killing, and you know how it is when you start killing. Like, yeah. these men are all hopped up on, uh, like, endorphins and murder. Yeah. Do you... Plus, this is guaranteed money. Yeah. Well, and Starbuck is, is the one who says to Ahab, like, look, it, the primary duty of a whaling ship is to, is to go out, find whales, get their oil, and return home quickly and hopefully profitably. And he, and he says, like... This isn't about revenge because, according to Starbuck, who, by the way, is a, a Quaker, as we learn. Yes. But he says, uh, revenge is only for the Lord to take. Mm -hmm. Like, we, that is not our business. Our business is whales, not not murdering whales that ate legs and hands and children. And even though the, this whale is like, and, and to that response, like, Ahab is like, I'm absolutely doing what the Lord would want because this is the devil and I am leading us to go kill the devil, essentially. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and so after he calls all this off in, in Starbuck uh, even proposes mutiny, you know, oh, where yeah. he gathers all the men together and he's like, hey, here's the rules of ocean. And <laughs> which is probably not what it's called, but... Um, it should be called that. It should. But he's the like rose or belly ocean. Um, <laughs> it says here that you've got to be his lover, lover, lover boy. <laughs> also, uh, chapter two: get out of his dreams, get into his car. Yeah. And his car. Huh? What is this car that Billy Ocean speaks of? It's a it's a boat of the land, bo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um. So. Yeah, but all, all the crew members that he... And it's really kind of Stubbs who he's talking to, the second mate about this. And he's like, uh, no, we are not going against Ahab. Like, re regardless of what that book says, like, you know. And then he kind of gives this laugh. He's like, look, yes, could could we be going to our deaths? Absolutely. But my philosophy is and remains, I'm going to have a good time doing it. And yeah. to that end, Stubbs becomes my favorite character. Um, where he's just like, I, you know what? This is all shits and giggles. Yeah. And if it ends with us dying, you know, I'm I'm still going to do it with Ahab as my captain. Yeah. And Plus you heard what Ahab says he's going to do it, the whale, and the whale will take his leg. Imagine what you do as if we meet him. Yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> I'll like come around. Stabbing... <laughs> Dude, they... <laughs> At a certain point, we'll get to it, but at a certain point, Ahab tells this crew that uh, harpoons forged in water are, uh, are not going to do the trick and asks them for their blood. 
yeah. to to cool the the uh, the iron. And I mean, and they do, you know, like Once again. We'll we'll just take it. Yeah. <laughs> like you know what I mean. So yeah, so he tells everybody back on the ship, we're gonna go get this fucking whale, and so yeah. they they head uh, off to to chase Moby Dick, and then. Uh, there's one point where a dude falls off the rigging mm-hmm. and into the water and they're like, okay, man overboard. And everybody goes to try to find him and they can't. And, and which is interesting to see the process, which is throw a barrel in the general vicinity <laughs> of the dude. And then you, you drop a boat to see if you can find him. Yeah. He's not around. And, and at the very moment that dude hits the water, the wind stops. Yes. And so now the Pequod is in the doldrums, not moving at all, with a crew that has now lost uh, uh, one of its crew members, and nothing but time on their hands, and a captain who is losing his goddamn mind. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And um, so they're just hanging out, and we get a scene where Queequeg is rolling through the bones not dice yes. not shooting dice duncan no, 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 no. Ro- rolling the bones like uh, uh uh doing some fortune telling yep and he looks down at what he sees and he's like oh fuck yeah. um <laughs> all right hey i'm gonna need to talk to the ship's carpenter I, lo- I love this, like, because it's just so matter, like, this, like, he's such a cool dude. He's just so matter of fact. He's like, oh, well, the bones say, well, the bones say that uh, I'm, I'm checking out soon. So, um, I need to speak to this carpenter and ask him how much it costs to make a coffin. Yeah, put it on my tab because I don't have that kind of cash on me. But you know, take it out of my my one three hundredth of the hole. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Yeah, he says I need a I need a coffin that's about six foot four, and I want most importantly, I I want you to caulk it up so that it will float. Yeah, because we're all gonna die at sea, and I want to be found. Yeah, and then stops talking, just is like you know I'm gonna wait to die now. Yeah, that, you know what? Like if you knew. If you were on a boat and you knew for sure, uh, the end is nigh. I can I can appreciate the. I just don't want to speak anymore. Yeah, I, uh, if something important happens, I'll I'll deal with it. Which yeah. <laughs> is, is kind of what happens because one of the other crew members is kind of fucking with Queequeg, and Ishmael yeah. steps in because you know Ishmael's like, hey, this is my buddy. Regardless of the fact that he just built a coffin and is now catatonic, <laughs> I'm still not going to let you, you know, uh, come at him with a knife, which is what's mm-hmm. happening. And so this guy starts to rough up Ishmael and Queequeg gets up, uh, just, you know, basically bends this guy over a barrel to the point where Ishmael was like, don't kill him, don't kill him. But, yeah. you know, I think he gets the point. And... At that point is where they run into the other ship, which the other captain, the Rachel, yeah, the, is the name the, of the ship. The Rachel is the name of the ship, yeah. And this captain basically says that they too ran in with an altercation of um, of, of Moby Dick. And if, <laughs> every time someone says that, Ahab's like, you didn't kill it, did you? Um, just to make sure, like, I've got blood vendetta trumps everything else. Just want to make sure. All right, we're good to go. But like, basically... His kid um, was was on a on a, on a boat, and um, I mean, Ahab's speaking truth to power here. Ahab's like, "Your son is dead," but this guy's like, "No, I think my son might still be alive. He's just very badly burned, and not. I think he's still alive. He's out there. Are you going to help me find him?" And of course, Starbucks like, "Listen, we're all God fearing Christian men on this boat. Um, it is our duty to help him." Uh, we we have to say yes, and he was like, "Well, do we?" He's like, "Yes, we have to say." <laughs> and then the, the guy on the other boat's like, "Can you hear me, Captain Ahab?" And he's like, "That I, I can't. I'm going into a tunnel. You're breaking up." Um, like, 
It's a dodgy connection here. Uh, but like, I don't have any more. reception out here. <laughs> I've only got one bar. Um, but the like the like you keep shouting over. You know, you, like you have to help me. You have to help me. And then he yeah, like, "Listen, I'm going to help you. I'm going to go and hunt that whale and avenge your dead son." Let's admit it. <laughs> right. Probably Let's dead. be real yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. I would <laughs> bet my one good leg. <laughs> that your son is dead as shit. He's he's gone. He's gone. Yeah. But what I'll do is listen. I will help you because I'm gonna go and hunt that motherfucker and extract some vengeance for my leg and your dead son. So everything's okay. And Rachel's like, oh, you like, damn you. I've got Ahab. the I've got the exact line because yeah. it's really good. It's uh, Ahab says, Captain Gardner, I seek the white whale, your own son's murderer. I am losing time. Goodbye and fare thee well, I say. God help you, Captain Gardner. And Captain Gardner's response to him is, and God forgive you, Captain Ahab. That's right. That's right. And so we leave. Suck my chubby. Chubby. <laughs> chubby. Yeah, so off they go. And uh, sure enough, they after they, they move on past the Rachel, they find moby dick or somebody in the mass spots him and sure enough you know uh ahab gives him the gold coin mm -hmm. and they're chasing after moby dick they haven't launched their boats or anything for him but they're on hot on his trail and then this storm hits mm -hmm. and uh once again starbuck is like captain we need to go around this storm like this <laughs> yeah. is gonna it's gonna sink the ship and he's like, no, 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 keep all the sails down, full yep. steam ahead, you know, in a time yep. before steam. But, you know, we, we are not slowing, we're not stopping, we're going right through this storm, because Moby Dick is right there in front of us, mm -hmm. and we're, we're catching up to him, and yep. we are not going to allow time for him to escape by, you know, raising the sails and uh, Yeah, when the boat the is a rocking boat, don't come a knocking. Yeah, and so Starbuck, you know, is, is going to cut the ropes holding the sail so that they, they're they pulled up. And Ahab grabs a harpoon and is like, so help me, I'll run you through. And it is this moment of like a showdown. Yeah. And then uh, all of a sudden all the masks start to glow green. Mm -hmm. And the storm starts to abate. And um, he he basically is like, I'll control the very elements of earth and wind and water. And, and touches uh, or holds up his harpoon, which then gets uh, lit by the same St. Elmo's fire. And it's mm -hmm. just... He is Zeus at that point. He is a god, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. And and it's another reason that why, at the end of this movie, that the crew behaves like they do, because Ahab has proven to be super yeah, well, like, Yeah, because, like, Starbuck, all the, like, all the way up to this point, is the dissenting, is the voice of reason. Mm -hmm. And he ultimately is the, the person that calls to arm the crew, sending them to their death. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's him. Like, the, the, the dissenting voice is the first voice that presses forward. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Right. Because at a certain point, he gives over to it. Like, he, he yeah. becomes resigned. And, and sure enough, the next day is when they catch up to Moby Dick. <laughs> and Moby Dick ain't fucking around, by the way. Dude. So they launch all the boats. It is at all hands. Like, we are. it is time to go... This is what the movie has been building up to. Yep. Time to go kill Moby Dick. And they end up uh, like throwing harpoons. They get it a couple of times. It's flipping over the long boats. It is, you know, it finally uh, Ahab himself gets onto Moby Dick. Yeah, and this basically is... for anyone that like for anyone that does not delay, I, I, like I as in like this is freaking Shyahalud. So this is like June as in riding the sandworm. He physically boards the whale, yeah, um, with his harpoon, and just starts 
Stabbing the shit out of him. Yeah, Ahab is the Kwisak Shadrach. Yeah. And <laughs> nice. I can I can say that this late at night. So. Uh, uh, but yeah, the, and this is the you know from hell's heart I stab at thee yes. for hate's sake I spit at thee. Like just understanding like I may not kill this well, but I am going to die doing my level best to do that. Yeah, and the previous scene as well, before they launch the the boats, like Ahab says that he can smell something, and he gets the crew to like agree that you know they can smell land. And this is where Ishmael regales the warning essentially that Elijah told him, "Listen, you will smell land, but there won't be land. You know, Ahab himself will be, you know, will be dragged down, but we'll return and beckon the crew to follow, and there will only be one that survives." So we've set things up. We're once again like as like setting it up just in case, right? The movies. Now in 50 minutes, this line was, was this foreboding tale was mentioned an hour and 20 minutes ago. Let's just recap. This is essentially what's happening in the last 15, 20 minutes of this movie. Yeah. Are you with us, audience? You are, right? Board the boats, let's go. Um, and of course, you have like st- stab, 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 but he gets caught in the rope. Like, yeah. All the different ropes that are around, you know, that they're using for the harpoons gets caught. And as once again, just as prophesied, he's dragged under the water to his death essentially mm-hmm. he's trapped and is drowned yeah there, um, there's a great moment where like moby dick dives mm-hmm. and everybody left in the boats like you know starbuck and and Queequeg and ishmael and, like the whole, yeah. stubs the whole crew are just kind of waiting like what the fuck what's yeah. what's going on it's and, okay you walk it off bro yeah <laughs> and uh, and and the, it, it's kind of a, a repetition of the uh, of the scene when they first, you know, get into the boats and row out, yeah. and they see these birds because that's the other thing about Moby Dick is that there are always gulls that seem to be hovering around him. Yeah, and it's a big ass whale. In fairness, like it's as big as the boat. Yes, huge. And uh, and and it's before Gregory Peck gets you know tied to him and all that, but when he's like. Steady, boys. He's around here somewhere. I can feel him. Wait for it. Wait for it. And yeah, but uh, but yeah, he gets dragged under. And then when Moby Dick resurfaces, he's. This is the thing that haunted my dreams for years. Yeah, it's, it's a particularly grim scene. <laughs> so I will give you that. It's like it's not pleasant. And if you caught this at the wrong time. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's gnarly. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's just him, you know, like strapped to this whale with one hand free so that as the whale is, you know, kind of cresting the waters, yeah. this just sheer momentum is making his forearm kind of flop over on his chest and then the, the back. The whale's using them for solar for signals. <laughs> You're right. Uh, like, he's, like... he's coming in for a landing. <laughs> So, but yeah, like so, he's, it looks like he's beckoning his crew over, which is Starbucks. Like, you know, oh look, the captain's dead, but he, he's beckoning us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that. Like Stubbs is like, mm, well, we're not seriously gonna go over there, are we? And he's like, well, we're we're unless you've got the line. He's, he basically says, uh, you know, we're uh, we're whalers. We don't run from. We kill whales. We don't run from them. Yeah. Um, and we're like, oh shit, that's the wrong answer. Yeah, and and so they go after Moby Dick, who wastes no time. Oh yeah, in decimating. I mean, just up in some ships, belly flops on others, whips yeah. his tail on others. I mean, it's just it's Moby Dick, you know, settling all the family scores, the yeah, Cataglias. <laughs> the Queequegs, the Starbucks. This is the this is the equivalent of being a foolish passenger sitting behind I don't know Mike Tyson on a plane and deciding to fuck with them. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they, it's, no, no good is going to come from this. <laughs> right. The moral of this movie could be boiled down to fuck around and find out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and the crew of the Pequod has fucked around in earnest. <laughs> And yeah. this is the scene where they find out. Yeah, yeah. It, like, it does. But uh, what I love about this, and we mentioned it earlier, is not only does he just upend all the boats and smash them and drown all the crew, it then turns his attention on, on the boat. Yeah, the on the Pequod boat. itself, yeah. And then with 
relative ease fuck that up as well yeah and it like it creates this vortex like the ship is sinking yeah. and then the impression is that moby dick himself drags it to the bottom of the sea yeah tea bags it. yeah and, <laughs> right like he's played a real good game of counter-strike and at the end of this the only person left is ishmael yes who finds queequeg's coffin Floating coffin because he asked for it to float. That that's right. It pops up out of the water in the wreckage of the Pequod, and that is where Ishmael stays until the Rachel, still hunting for survivors, mm -hmm. now finds Ishmael. And uh the line here is the coffin. Drowned Queequeg's coffin was my life boy for one whole day and night. It sustained me on that soft and dirge-like mane. Then a sail appeared. It was the Rachel. The Rachel who in her long melancholy search for her own missing children found another orphan. The drama's done. All are departed away. The great shroud of the sea rolls over the Pequod, her crew, and Moby Dick. I only am escaped, alone to tell thee. The end! Yeah. Done. Where yep. did you? <laughs> I mean, well, it's, like, it's like, no, there is no happy ending. Yeah. It is Which just... is great. That's one of the, like, how the book finishes. Like, like you don't want the Hollywood happy ending here. You want, like, this, like, what, what Ahab did was he foolish thing. And foolish things have foolish consequences, so. Yeah, it would, Deal. the Hollywood ending would be if Moby Dick and uh, Ahab fell in love. Yeah, and they, were, they, to, like, they both found out their mother's name was what is it? Martha. <laughs> Martha. Your name is Martha. Martha Dick. <laughs> Mine is Martha Ahab. <laughs> Can we be friends? Uh, uh, like uh, yeah, it, it needs it needs that. It, it works. It, it works incredibly well. It's very poignant. It, like, dramatic score at the end. Um, yeah, it's a classy movie, Bo. It's, yeah, it, it it's really, really great. Um, I, all right, so that is the plot of the movie. Let, let us, uh, in, in true Dark Parade fashion, let us come to the cast of this movie. Yeah, the ridiculous cast of this movie. <laughs> right, and I mean, as we've talked about, I mean, you're talking about, uh, Gregory Peck as Ahab, who's incredible yep. in this. Richard Basehart as Ishmael, who is, I mean, he's kind of the audience surrogate in so many ways, yeah. but he's really, he, he's totally fine at, uh, in that role. Um, you've got Leo Ginn as Starbuck. Mm -hmm. uh, James Justice as Captain Boomer. Harry Andrews as Stubbs. Um, you've got uh, 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 Friedrich von Litterberg as Queequeg. Yeah, he's excellent. Yes. Yeah, Royal Dono as Elijah, uh, Seamus. And whenever he tells you something, you fucking listen you, to that. You perk up your ears and you pay attention. Orson Welles, of course, is Father Maple. Um, and, I mean, it's just, it's a murderer's row of character actors, like you said. Yeah. And so the argument I would make here, Duncan, is that there is a bit of theatrical kind of acting in this movie mm -hmm. though not as much as in some but i mean there it is of that time right it's mid 50s and it's still like some of these performances are kind of playing to the back rows yeah but then you have gregory peck who i don't think is doing that he's doing a much more subtle kind of performance it's nuanced it, it very, it very much is like i said like if this was for the stage this would be far more over the top it's, it's interesting as well when you look at the people that have played the role before and since as well it's all it's all thespians of the stage because mm -hmm. it's seen as being specifically because of the dialogue mm -hmm. it's seen as being this kind of it's, it's akin to shakespeare yeah Oh, you know what I mean? very it's, much so. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, tra it's treated in such a way, so you kind of have to have that, not not pedigree, but you have to have that that gravitas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the one thing that this movie is aided by not having. I think like Peck plays this as a very dark role, 
Um, and like you don't have, I don't need to to hear him bellowing out or like sometimes the quieter man is the the more intimidating, scary man. Like the man that doesn't like wear his emotions on his sleeve is the man that you should be wary of. And that's Peck's performance throughout this one. It is, I'd like I, I imagine at times people could maybe see it as being tad wooden, um, but I think it adds to that because like his passion. Well, you mentioned before about his bed being like he he sees his bed as being the coffin and sleep as being death. Um, you know, he, like he lives for one purpose and that one purpose is the vengeance that he needs to get uh, against the whale that took his leg. Um, and that in itself is what I think makes his performance kind of great. It's it's not one dimensional purely in that mm-hmm. facet, but almost everything he does is kind of saturated or has an air of the central core of the character and I, I just don't know what would happen if someone else is in that is in that role at that time you know like I, would, I was even just playing like fucking around with the cast thinking about like could you put this person in there and all the rest I think he's I think he's he's well portrayed in this one I think he, he does a fine job is he the best actor in the world no does he need to be no I think, like, ultimately, I believe him as a character, and that's the the hallmark of great actor. I believe when he when he says he's for vengeance, I believe he's for vengeance. When he's like right to the very end, even when he says the lines are clunky or whatever, he's the clunky old dialogue that he's having to read out when he's doing it. That scene of him on the whale stabbing the whale is powerful. It's incredibly powerful. It packs that punch. So, yeah, I um, I don't know. I think. I think it's very easy just to be like, well, he's surrounded by great actors and there was great actors out at the time. That, like, having, like, how many times have we watched a movie and we're like that? The cast should work here mm-hmm. because these are great actors and I'm watching it going, why did I not like your performance? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what oh, what sure. was it? The, yeah, what, like, so, it's, I think sometimes it's very easy just to get swept up in that. But, um, oh, I, yeah, I, oh, I, I can oh. nitpick moments, but yeah. in terms of you know the the feeling that i come away with especially about gregory peck in particular mm-hmm. who again you know like people complained he was too young peck himself was like i was too young to play this role um yeah i should have been older i should have you know the the dialogue should have been a little bit more uh more human uh for for lack of a better term but it all kind of works like i i i think this may be a case where the artist is a little bit hypercritical of their own yeah. performance and i think i think are... also if critics are yeah it's not only that i think if critics are also kind of leaning in with well he's surrounded by some heavyweights and maybe he's not the best choice i think it'd be very easy to sometimes listen to those voices with too much yeah and <laughs> on it. yeah and, and peck also said that um he uh he didn't like the direction that john houston gave him because you and he but he would like in the same breath he would acknowledge like john Huston's an amazing filmmaker mm-hmm. he's he's a brilliant guy not necessarily the best director of actors yeah and but it, that's just because john Huston would be like suck it up and act like a man you pansy and he was like hey i'm trying to get to a place here with this performance you yeah. suck <laughs> How about you do the next scene without sucking so much? And that was kind of his direction. And Gregory Peck was like, hey, John, I'm I'm trying to get to this place of vengeance. Well, then get to it. Quit wasting yeah. everyone's time. I, w- I was Gandalf, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, there's, there's, I think, but you think about it as well. I think you can't see that on the screen. You know what I mean? No, it, that, whatever happened behind the scenes in terms of the like, it, John Houston just does its own. Like he was the easiest guy to work with. Yeah, but it, but he also was in the business of making classic movies. Yeah, his pedigree speaks for himself. Right, like, his it's pedigree true. up to fifty six is fucking ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, if he had only done Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Yeah. yeah. Still a genius, but also, like, yeah. you know, 
big sleep and Maltese Falcon, blah, blah, blah. Um, he's, he's just a, a, a fantastic filmmaker and was up until he died. Like he, yeah. even the dead, that movie with Angelica Houston is quite good. Um, it was yeah. the last movie he ever did, but, um, who's his daughter for those that don't know. Yeah. If you were not familiar yeah. with, yeah, if you weren't John familiar Houston. with like, Oh, they should have seen sort of That's like, that's. And yeah. Daughter. And, and maybe it's, it's worth saying John Huston was uh, the director of such films as uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, Key Largo, mm-hmm. Asphalt Jungle, African Queen, Moby Dick, uh, The Unforgiven, Night of the Iguana. Uh, Lucky's Falcon. Yeah. Uh, later in life did Pritzi's Honor, did Under the Volcano with Albert Finney. I mean, the guy did nothing but make terrific movies for most yeah, make, of his career make, yeah make tremendous hollywood movies yeah yeah um, that was, yeah they were they were hollywood movies but they were also like they were art and yeah. at a time when hollywood was still figuring out what that i mean like he was making movies his first movie was the maltese falcon i know yeah that's his first movie yeah and and that's fucking n- nuts. 1941, when yeah. movies had only been talking for about 20 years. Yeah, and it, one it, of, one of the definitive like it, it basically that movie in itself pretty much kickstarts the film noir genre. Yeah, oh. it's insane. It's insane. Like, like so, but the, there's a part of me that thinks like when you get to that certain level and you're that far into your career, 14, 15 years, and you're making Moby Dick and it's this big production and all the rest. Like, if you're an actor, right? I understand there's a bit of ego that comes with that, but like you follow that director because you look at what he's done. Mm-hmm. And and by the way, he also wrote the African Queen and wrote Key Largo and wrote yeah. Tre- Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And wrote Sergeant York, by the way. Which, which is what I was saying to you before. So, like, when he's sitting having a chat with Bradbury, they're having a bit of conflict about the script. It's not as if the dude can sit there and say, listen, I dabble with screenplays. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> Once yeah, yeah. again, the pedigree's there. Like, it's, it's like, you like the, 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 proof, the proof is there, and it is, you know, guess what? It's being judged, and people like it, so... Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. So, regardless of what was going on behind the scenes, I still think the performances in this movie um, are are terrific. And yeah. even though it's crazy over the top, that Orson Welles scene, it is almost just like everybody. We're gonna stop the movie for a minute and just yeah. let one of the great actor writer directors of our time do some shtick, yeah. and and everybody enjoy. Yeah. It's, it's good to have it. Like, it's once again, it's very clever filmmaking to have it in the position that it's in as well. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean? It's right. It's right at the start. It's it's setting up. You've had that whimsical, like we're all going in the sea and all that, mm-hmm. and then you get the warning about what happens when you go in the sea. Um, like, <laughs> but then we're going in the sea. Uh, but like, it hangs over it, and it's 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 great. I thought, well, yeah, the casting is, is you know, it. it could it have been better? Maybe. Do I want it to be better? No. I like it the way it is. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk a little themes because there are a couple in this movie. That means, yep. Um, obviously, I mean, we talked about obsession and 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 revenge and so forth. Yep. And that's the primary one. But there's other stuff going on in this movie as well. There is um, there is the idea of like the march towards industrialization and... Mm-hmm what the impact that has on nature um yep. interestingly as well when they talk about the bikini atoll being where like hey this is where we're gonna find moby dick um that is not in the book mm-hmm. um and it, it it's worth noting if you did not know this from history the bikini atoll is where a lot of the early a-bomb testing went yeah, and I I don't think that's an accident. I think that is very much John Huston saying, you know, here is us fucking around and playing God, which is what one of the characters accuses Ahab of. You know, Starbuck accuses Ahab of playing God oh, in yeah. his search for vengeance, and that 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 ultimately leads to the destruction of not just Ahab but his entire crew, 
And so I would argue that this movie is also about, you know, basically flaunting, uh, <laughs> flaunting God's will to some extent, yeah. and not and well, there's, there's like you think about those tests, what those tests led to afterwards, which was direct vengeance on Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, th- I mean, there's, it can't be an accident. Cannot. It's, yeah. Once again, it's so on the nose, bro. Yeah, but it right. It doesn't have to be hidden to be good. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, there there's plenty of religious stuff happening in this movie with, you know, the prophet Elijah and Ahab being the mm-hmm. uh, what the 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 sacrilegious king from yeah. the Bible as well. And yeah, you know, the story of Jonah and the whale. It's, you know, it's, it's it's all in there as well. So. Um... And I like that. I th- something the thing about like linking back once again to the the idea of the the bomb testing and all the rest. It is good to acknowledge that even though the story is old, the the, the idea of vengeance um, is timeless. Yeah, yeah. Well, like you said, you know, if if you're if you're going to kill someone in revenge, to dig two graves. It, yeah, it is. It's that kind of thing. Of um, and also. There, there's a healthy dose of just like humanity is is susceptible to its basest urges, yes, and that is what can destroy us. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is the idea that we cannot live in harmony with nature, with the world around us. Um, that you know, if we if we take a slight, like you know, Moby Dick did not eat <laughs> Ahab's leg, yeah, for you know spiteful reasons. He's just trying to survive. Like Moby Dick is just a creature trying to live. Yeah. Uh, but when you know when fired upon, returns fire in the gnarliest possible way. It will destroy <laughs> everything. Coming at me, bro. Coming at me. Yeah, which is kind of what I love most about Moby Dick as this entity in in the movie. I mean, it's you know Moby Dick is talked about from beginning to end. As this, as, like this, not just a force of nature, but as this supernatural force that is the devil himself or a demon or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's not really the case. I mean, it is, again, just an animal trying to survive. And it's and it's it's Ahab who dooms the crew, not Moby Dick. Yes. Um. Any, anything else you want to draw out? I mean, there again, it's lighter than the book, but yeah, I mean, I think that. But I, once again, I would, I think you kind of have to do that. I think like like the the trapping of trying to cover all the themes in the book would doom the movie mm-hmm. and make it nigh on unwatchable. You know, what I mean, there's there's too much stuff. It's too dense with that. You have to strip all that out, and and you know the fact that they managed to get as much of that into the movie, as well as make the movie itself, I think, is commendable. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's let's start bringing this in for a landing here, and do final thoughts and scores. Mm. Uh, obviously, we do a five star scale on this here show. Uh, we allow half stars, no quarter stars, because unlike Captain Ahab, we are not monsters. <laughs> and um I I'll tell you what I'll kick us off on final thoughts because I want to talk we have, we haven't discussed this at all. I want to yeah. talk about the effects in this movie mm-hmm. which are primitive at times. Yep. But for the time that this movie came out mm-hmm. are kind of astounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um like even the, the there are a couple of scenes that are very clearly like this is a model whale pulling a model ship and they're, they're yeah. kind of mechanized uh, yeah. people in the boat rowing it. Yeah, and that's it, not a boat behind these people. That's a painting. Right. right. You know what I mean? Like, it's a painting screen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're using all the all the, the, the tricks and gimmicks of the time. But that said, there are also moments in this movie where I'm like, damn, that looks real good. Mm-hmm. There, there are some in particular of the well when you get like close-ups of the eye yeah where it's like i know this is not a real whale it's not that convincing but it's real damn good 
Yeah. And and also where you see like people in actual boats out on the actual ocean being pulled by you know what is probably just this rubber back of a whale <laughs> yeah. tied to a boat or whatever but it looks great mm-hmm. and you know Ahab standing on the whale and stabbing it looks great and it, you know for as many moments as I have that are like eh that doesn't look fantastic there are just as many where I'm like man for not just for 1956 for 1976 this would have been mm-hmm. impressive and I, you know, I think as a work of, like, technical mastery, mm-hmm. it's one of the best movies of the 50s in terms of just looking, like, the scale of it and what you're trying to, you're trying to trying to make a movie on the water. Ask Steven Spielberg about how that works out for you. Oh, yeah. James Cameron, just like, uh, you know, I mean, the list goes on. Like, as soon as you move in, to, as soon as you're dealing with nature and the elements, you are, you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, but I, I yeah, it's, it, like I said, just, I, I think we hadn't really talked about, and I think the effects work in this is, adequate to amazing mm-hmm. and it kind of runs the gamut but some of that stuff looks so good man i would just i would love to see more of it uh but i mean it, it and, and the movie does not try to hide moby dick ever 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 no no <laughs> you know it is not jaws where it's like okay there are three barrels and that means that moby dick is around here somewhere like yeah that the scene where that whale opens up its mouth and starts swallowing ships and stuff like they do the level best they can to put that on film and it's all i mean this is you know i guess you have to say it these days but this is all pre-computer effects that there's oh yeah it's just model works and puppets and that kind of thing but and time yeah and a lot of in and in honest to goodness craft somebody building yeah. this thing and being like i think this is gonna work this is the best we can do so let's see how it goes uh, mm-hmm. i think i think that stuff is just awesome i love it um, what about you? What, uh, what what haven't we said about Moby Dick? I, I suppose we touched on it, but the only other thing I would say is the the score by Philip Sainton, oh, I yeah. think, is, is great. He didn't do a ton of movie work, actually, overall. He wasn't primarily known for that. Um, but I, I think it's, like we mentioned, it, it has all the grandeur. Uh, and drama of those later scenes juxtaposed against just really fun, bouncy, adventurous, jaunty music as well. I think it, I think it works surprisingly well. It's a, it's a very handsome score, mm-hmm. uh, is what I would say. And I think it's one of those ones that I think um, it never overpowers anything that you see in the movie. It knows exactly what, the way it's actually placed is is kind of is kind of phenomenal. But uh, you know, it delivers it delivers on those moments through it. So and that's about the only thing that I would say that we haven't mentioned. I think uh, out with that, we we done this one good, bro. All right. Well, what is your uh, your score of this movie? Where do you come down on it? Um, I mean, it is it's a bona fide classic, and the you know the the gut instinct is to is to jump in there and slap a big old five on it. I'm going to come just a little bit below. I'm going to give it a 4.5. The only reason I'm going to lean there is I do feel, and we were speaking about this slightly off here, I do feel there are a couple of scenes in the middle where I understand why they're there. It's a different time period as well where I'm like, that. We could trim, trim this down a little bit. You know, it doesn't have to be an hour 50. Could have very easily been an hour and 40, maybe even an hour 35. And I don't think it dramatically affects the movie overall. Um, but I also would say as a counterpoint to that argument, at no point do I feel like the movie's like dragging it, you know, dragging its heels or anything like that as well. It's just one of those things where I could see a bit of editing and a bit of tightening up overall in the movie. Uh, out with that, it gives you gives you so much good news. If you've not seen Moby Dick before, um, then watch it. And if you haven't, if you're like me, you hadn't seen it in a while, watch it anyway. I mean, yeah, <laughs> shouldn't have to twist your arm. Very difficult to get on Blu-ray these days. I believe Twilight oh, Times. Oh, kidding, um, man. Um, and Twilight Time only ever used to do limited runs, and they've never went under, so they don't exist as a label anymore. So you got to hope 
somewhere down the road, now that Warner Brothers are doing all their, let's just try and capture all the collectors that are collecting all these things. You got to hope. 4K, Moby Dick, make it happen. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I was really hoping to have this one on the shelf and that yeah. Blu-ray uh, because it was a limited run. Um, you know, it's the like cost. T- yeah, it, costs are ridiculous yeah, for the. You know, it's a couple hundred off, bucks because it yeah. will come. It yeah. will come. Uh, and just you, the, uh, like, I streamed it on Amazon, and it's it's a great transfer of the movie. It will be. Yeah. The, it'll be the same transfer. Yeah. It'll be the because it's it's a Warner archive. So the one that Twilight Time would have put out would have been the Warner archive version of it. So the 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 thing is, they hold a print of it. Yeah. Like the, which has been digitized, it's all digital, and their stuff is generally shit hot. It's just a case of them working through their slate of movies till they eventually get to Moby Dick, and then you'll be bored. Yeah, um, I'm with you. I'm gonna come down at four and a half as well. Nice. I th- I think my complaints are along the lines of, of yours. That yeah, there there are moments where I'm like, yeah, you could have trimmed, you know, thirty seconds here, a minute here, and and get this thing to like hour 40 and it would be tight and right um that said though that i mean that's how i justify the half point off but it's so entertaining you're like like me that you're like i'm kind of feel like i have to do it to to justify my grade but you're gonna have a good time watching this yeah i I mean anyone who hasn't seen it like you said if you haven't seen it or you haven't seen it in a long time like remind yourself how good this movie is and you know it 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 holds up real well uh yeah. when i was watching it uh for this recording like i was wildly entertained i yeah, I, had, God, yeah. I had a blast watching this movie again and talking about it again it's just like yeah man this movie is metal as fuck yeah um and and gregory peck is great blah 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 it's 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 terrific moby dick is a you know it's a goddamn masterpiece um all right so now duncan we come to a phase of the show I call three things you may not know about Moby Dick. Ooh. Not the whale himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, if indeed it is a him. I don't want to, I don't want to misgender the whale. Um, but the, the film. And so mm-hmm. we talked a little bit about the writing and, and let's, let's do uh, one that's kind of a catch all of writing fun stuff. So John Euston meets Ray Bradbury for the first time about writing the script because Ray Bradbury has been hired and uh, Ray Bradbury himself says, and I quote, I've never been able to read the damn thing. And John Houston said, you know, well, here's a copy of the book. Read as much as you can. And so he sends him away with the book. And I don't think that Ray Bradbury ever re- read it all. Um, <laughs> Go the bull. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. He, he did yeah. a bow. <laughs> and Roald Dahl, also is uncredited but did a pass on the script which is interesting and it's just like these fucking guys just hanging about right ray shit. bradbury <laughs> roald Dahl, and john Huston writing the script for moby dick it's it's too good to be true and better yet when it came to orson welles scenes he wrote his own scene of course he did yeah he was just like, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of this, John. Don't even worry about it. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's terrific. Um, all right, here's another thing you probably don't know about Moby Dick. The way that they achieved that kind of uh, a washed out look that the film mm-hmm. has is they would do this it was basically three layers of film that they put on top of each other one was black and white and then the other two are color and they recombine the film with those layers to and then they they did another pass where they added a silver layer to everything so that the movie has this kind of dreamy pastel look to it because of an, and it was a process invented by the cinematographer or um, yeah the director of photography Oswald Morris and John Huston who were just like we want it to look timeless and did this crazy ass stunt to get a very particular look to this movie um another thing you may not know about Moby Dick 
is that uh, in in the scene where you know we talked about this a couple of times, where Starbuck is like, "Hey, how about you go to bed?" And that's a coffin. Um, that that's actually true, not in, uh, in the metaphorical sense, but in the quite literal sense, because officers on a ship would sleep in essentially a box, and, right. and if they were to die, they would actually uh, just toss that body into, into the box and there's your coffin so it's it was true and also the uh, uh, the the other the you know non-officers on the ship just the the whalers and whatnot they would sleep in hammocks and if they died their hammocks were used as burial shrouds that would then just be stitched up so who would sleep this is this is why I've got insomnia. <laughs> yeah, you. I mean, they were literally if if something were to happen, they were literally sleeping in their own coffins. <laughs> so, um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, to this day, the movie has not made money. It has not made its money back, according to uh, the trivia. Um, but the last thing that you may not know about Moby Dick is that uh, Gregory Peck had such a, a, a problem with his own performance in the movie. Steven Spielberg, when it came time to do Jaws, wanted to show a clip of Moby Dick in the movie. I am aware of this, but yeah, tell me what's next. So Robert Shaw was going to, Quint was going to be introduced in a movie theater watching Moby Dick and mm -hmm. doing like a Cape Fear, like laughing at the screen. Yeah. <laughs> and... Gregory Peck was like, that's fine. You can have him watch it in Moby Dick. But if you show me, I'll kill you and your children, Steven. But yeah, he just would not allow Steven Spielberg to yeah. show his performance in Jaws. And so because he refused to allow Spielberg to do that, Spielberg just cut that scene. So um, an actor's reticence to allow mm -hmm. his own performance to be captured in yet another movie prevented us from seeing quint watching moby dick yeah and i, I kind of like i'm i'm a pick on this one i i not for his reasons yeah 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 i, I don't think it needs once again i like i'm you get enough nods and references to moby dick throughout that movie having a clip of that movie in there is i think it's one step too far. Yeah, and also that the opening of "Y'all know me, you know what I do for a living." Yeah, it's one it's, of the best openings of all time. It's one of the best introductions to a character committed to film. Yeah, yeah, but ee! yeah, <laughs> it's just like <laughs> it's just like this is like this is how you introduce your badass character. Yeah. Um. Uh, all right, I think that is going to bring us to the end of of Moby Dick on this Moby Dick sized discussion of Moby Dick featuring the song Moby Dick by Led Zeppelin. Hey, Bo, you best believe in that this was a review. <laughs> you best be believing in Whalen reviews. Yep. You're in <laughs> one. <laughs> You're in one. So, all right. Uh, uh, obviously, I'll, I'll, I'll steal your thunder on this one. If you want to hear more of us yammering about movies and uh, the the show Slasher for well that's uh, by the time done. no 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 done. by the time this airs we'll be done. So in the future where this this discussion drops, Slasher will be entirely done for us. I, I want to live there. Uh, yeah, I want to go to there. <laughs> um, but it, it, we will soon be starting a discussion of the Pink Panther movies. My pick. Uh, that you can you can jump in on so uh, on your your podcast catcher of choice uh, look for Duncan and Bo come correct and you can uh, you can hear uh, more from us about movies but other than that Duncan talk yeah. about uh, a show that I am sadly not on all the time although I've made appearances you have yeah yeah uh, so my main show is podcast under the stairs it's a kind of hodgepodge of lots of different things um, and uh, yeah it, you can catch it wherever you listen to podcasts, just name podcast under the stairs. I also have a sister feed called the Teapots Collective, um, which houses 
several different shows with different themes, doing the Nasty, which is a video Nasty exclusive podcast, uh, where to begin with, which is currently in this season doing uh, my recommendation of 10 movies in the film noir and neo-noir genre, which will one, introduce you to the subgenre, two, round out your knowledge, and three, give you the building block from which you can go away and do your own research and find your own movies. Um, Opera Omnia, which picks a director and runs through their entire filmography. It comes back next month for its new season. Um, Leaving Chronicle, which is a European horror exclusive podcast, which I will rope in Bo to come on sometime soon. All you have to do is pick a European horror movie that's never been discussed on that show that you really want to discuss with me. You come across and we'll do it. Have you heard of a movie called Tenebrae? <laughs> Dude, I would do Tenebrae in a second. Oh, all right. It will also be like the 17 millionth time I've done Tenebrae, but I would do it with you. It does, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. yeah uh, all that stuff, yeah, can be found at teapotscast.com. Um, <laughs> totally coming in at the last minute to announce the end of the show. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as always, man, thank you so much. I mean, you, you know that as much as it pains me to say, uh, you were the best. I, I would not want to talk about Moby Dick with anyone else. And now, uh, in a fuck off, <laughs> no, in a non-video <laughs> podcast, I'm going to uh, reveal my Moby Dick. Oh dear! Yeah, it's why is it so white and veiny? Yeah, <laughs> it's been around perdition's flame, Duncan. <laughs> From... You best believe in them, Bo's <laughs> Moby Dick. You're For... in one. For hate's sake, it spits at thee. I'll be back to close out the show. <laughs> All right, there you have it, folks. That is Moby Dick with uh, Duncan McLeish. I had a wonderful time with that conversation. Uh, it's always easy and good to talk to Duncan because it means I don't have to do nearly as much work. That guy likes to chat, and uh, I do too, and, and that feels good. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I know I uh, I certainly did. And looking ahead to the the next couple of weeks, we've got uh, one more of these of the uh, the horror on and beneath the waves. Uh, and I think you're really going to enjoy that episode. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, that is going to be uh, Dagon with uh, Brian and Jamie Sammons both. Uh, Brian, of course, is a Lovecraftian expert, and we'll get into the whys of that. And Jamie is an expert on making me laugh. So <laughs> and we will have that. Uh, and and at the end of this very week, we're going to have a What You Watching with Jamie and Bo. So you'll get plenty of Jamie in the next couple of weeks. Um, I would also point out, uh, to close out the show here... Uh, please rate and review where that is possible on the podcatcher of your choice. You can also listen to these episodes over on YouTube if that is your preferred method for uh, ingesting them. And uh, be sure you give it a thumbs up over there as well. That helps with the visibility of the show. Uh, please share the show around. Uh, as a, a woman I respect says, share however you can with whomever you can. And, uh, and that is much appreciated. So, lots coming. Uh, you can also check out all the old episodes over on legionpodcast.com, the-dark-parade. And uh, you can get all of these episodes a couple of days early on uh, Legion Podcasts on Patreon. So that's uh, patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. And the YouTube channel, of course, legionpodcast.com. And the... YouTube channel, of course, youtube.com forward slash Legion Podcast. And I think that's about everywhere you can get this, right? Uh, if you want to contact me to recommend an episode or give me some feedback on any of the episodes you've heard, you can do so on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Dark Parade. You can also uh, find me on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, and though both of those methods are, you know, social media, I like to check out about once a day. Uh, frankly, I enjoy not being on social media very much, but, uh, you can also find, uh, on the Legion page, if you go to legionpodcast.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade, you can, uh, find a link to the discord server. And that's where 
you can hit me up just about any time. I'm sitting at my computer. I'm pretty much there. So, uh, I hope you uh, have enjoyed this episode. We got more to come. And thank you, as always, for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you soon.